Well, hey there, everybody. Happy, uh, happy Tuesday. And let's not play that thing again. There we are. <laughs> happy Tuesday, everybody, and welcome to yet another Ball Publishing webinar. I'm Chris Beatty's editor of Grower Talks uh, and Green Profit Magazines and the e-newsletter Acres Online, and you are attending a uh, a webinar entitled "Get More from Your Growing Media." We're going to spend uh, about 50 to 60 minutes really going in depth on uh, on the subject. Now, uh, I think growing media is one of those things. It's a bit like sunlight and water. We definitely take it for granted, but you know, as well as I do, that without a good mix, and when, when I say good, I mean a, a mix that's appropriate to the crop and or crops that you're growing, you will not have a crop. Um, some of you might have horticulture degrees, and maybe you've learned all this stuff years ago. You might even be soil scientist. But do you know that a refresher never hurts? And I love the story that Jack Nicholas, world famous, world renowned golfer, every season would go to his, uh, his teacher, Jack Grout, and say, Jack, teach me how to golf. And he'd go over the fundamentals. So this, uh, ref if it's a refresher for you, it won't hurt a bit. And I tell you what, if you aren't sure about the, the physical and chemical um, and biological properties of your potting mix, uh, as, as I am, <laughs> as I'm not, I should say, you are in the right place. And of course, um, I am never the expert on the topic. But one thing I'm an expert at, and that is finding experts. And we've got an expert expert for you today. He is uh, Mr. Troy Beagle, um, a grower services specialist for the Mid-Atlantic U.S. for Premier Tech of Quebec, Canada. Welcome, Troy. Thanks, Chris. There he is. You, Good they, to see you. You know what my guests like to do? They like to wait till the very last second before they make them nervous. To show themselves. <laughs> then I'm thinking, what if he went away? What if? Something <laughs> He's right there. Troy, how are you? And where is there? Where are you broadcasting from today? Well, I'm broadcasting from uh, Pennsylvania in a little town called Quakertown, about an hour north of Philadelphia. Quakertown, beautiful part of the world. Not Quebec, eh? <laughs> not, no, not Quebec. We do have some, uh, some of us are, are stateside, so that's, that's where we're located. There you go. We appreciate that. And tell me, how did you uh, get into potting mixes? In a nutshell, what's your journey? Well, it's an interesting journey. Uh, when I was at uh, doing my master's degree at Penn State, I was working with wedding agents and uh, how it affects peat moss. And from there came this job offer with Premier. And that's how I ended up with uh, Premier and working with Promix. All right. Well, we're just going to find out just how expert you are on this uh, this topic today. Maybe we'll get some really tough questions from our audience out there. So we will. feel free. Speaking of which, let me call up a quick little uh, screen share here. I'm going to be doing a fair bit of this today, just briefly on and off. Questions. Yes, we take questions. In fact, somebody already emailed me one that I'll be, I'll be sure to ask. There's a, uh, a Q&A tool somewhere there on your desktop on the dashboard to this Zoom thing. We're all pretty familiar with Zoom nowadays, right? So use that to put your questions in. If it's pertinent to the topic that Troy happens to be on at the moment, I may interrupt and say, Troy, Bob from Schenectady wants to know such and such. Uh, otherwise, we'll save it for the end, but we will be sure to, uh, to, to leave time for that. Uh, and um, just to change, there we go. Yes, this webinar, this is the first question that's always asked. It's never, how do I check my pH? It's always, will this, can I watch this again? Always, always at uh, growertalks.com slash webinars, the same place you signed up very conveniently. It takes me a half hour to an hour to get it archived. It'll be right up there for you to, to, to share. And I'll give this again at the end because invariably somebody will ask me halfway through, will this be archived? I'll tell you, it is the number one question on the industry's mind right now. Uh, and I think that is it. So I'm going to stop sharing. And uh, Troy, you are going to begin sharing, which we had a few challenges with early, earlier on as we were getting set up for this. Yeah. Troy had to clean up his desktop and take all the um, embarrassing <laughs> things off of there, sports betting apps and <laughs> family pictures. Yeah, so let there me get go. right to this. There we go. Look at that desktop. If you saw mine, oh my gosh, <laughs> oh, no. no. <laughs> Well, if you see my physical desktop, it's a totally different situation. <laughs> All right. So there we go. All right. So I guess I will begin. Chris, thanks for the warm uh, opening there. I appreciate that. And as Chris said, I'm Troy Beagle from uh, Premier Tech Grower Services, which is uh, 
we offer uh, basically uh, services and and support for the ProMix product line. And I cover basically the Mid-Atlantic and kind of Eastern Midwest part of the United States. So today we're gonna to talk about getting more from your growing medium. So keep in mind that growing media is a component or it's a piece of just say a tool in the toolbox of the many things you have uh, to produce a crop. We know we have fertilizers, we have chemicals, pesticides, we have environmental controls. All these things contribute to the success of the crop you grow in your greenhouse. Now, as we know, not all growing media work for every single individual person. Some uh, growing media, for instance, some uh, customers we find bark growing media work better for them than let's say a peat-based mix. So it depends on kind of your preferences and, and what works best for your situation. But generally speaking, what we look at are the crops that are growing. You know, are you growing Outdoors, you're growing indoors, you're growing plugs. Those types of crops will influence the type of growing media that you would need. We also look at cultural practices. If you're in a growing situation where maybe the greenhouses have low ceilings, uh, there's a lot of humidity, it's kind of hard to get airflow, probably a mix that dries out faster would make more sense or something at least that has, has a higher level of air porosity. Uh, and we also look at the time of year. Certainly growing in the winter, as we all know, is very different than growing in the late spring into the summer months. And the last thing we look at is insurance features. Yes, growers do like the uh, inclusion of biological additives in their growing media. You have some that will help with nutrient acquisition and others that can help with, with disease suppression as well. So those things we'll talk about a little bit later. But the bottom line is the growing media doesn't really grow the crop. It's really the skill of the grower and the inputs that go into it that help produce a high quality crop. But as we all know, if the growing media doesn't work best for your situation, then it's probably time to look at something that works better. So in this presentation, we're gonna talk about three things, physical properties, chemical properties, and biological properties. So starting with physical properties, now if we take a look at the individual components that are used to make up a growing media, we have a large plethora of materials out there in the market today. And of course, this is, is not an exhaustive list. But in general, we look at it, you know, instead of going into nuances of every single one of them, let's just say that, for instance, your organic components, you know, your peat, your core, uh, your wood products, all those have a tendency to have very, fairly high water holding capacity and relatively decent air porosity. But they also do tend to settle a little bit more over time, so you get a little bit more compaction, and they're also very lightweight. As soon as we start bringing aggregates in, like your perlite, your vermiculite, these have a tendency to reduce your water holding capacity to some degree and increase your airspace. So in general, individual components have some great physical properties, but once we put them together into a mix, these individual components, when they work together, they produce different types of properties, uh, kind of, you know, two plus two don't, doesn't necessarily equal four in all cases. So if we look at different categories of growing media, so we're going to take the components, we're going to mix them together and we're going to create a mix. First look at a peat perlite mix or even a peat core perlite growing media. So in general, if we look at peat and core, both of them have very similar water holding characteristics. They also have very similar air porosities. So tweaking the different percentages, it, it does make some difference, but in general, it's the perlite that makes a greater difference in the growing media. So we tend to find as the perlite percentage increases, we tend to increase our air space in our growing media because plant roots do need oxygen to breathe. We also decrease our water holding capacity because we replace air space with, with what used to hold water. And in general, because there's less water retention, we tend to find our growing media dries out faster. And I don't think this is a mystery to anybody who's listening to this presentation. So in general, higher percentage perlite growing media, whether it be peat-based or peat core-based, when I say higher percentage, we're talking 20, 25, maybe 30%, really are ideal for situations where you have higher humidity growing conditions or where the conditions are low light, you get short days or cloudy, a lot of rain. So we're talking winter months, for instance, or early spring months. Uh, those are times of year when a high percentage perlite mix makes sense because you have good air space. Since things aren't drying out very well, these tend to have reduced water holding capacity anyway. They're also good mixes to use uh, when you have employees that tend to overwater, which we do tend to find does take place a lot. So again, that works out really well for a lower percentage perlite mix. So a peat perlite or a peat core perlite mix, 
with 15% perlite or less, although they work very well year round, not a problem, they tend to be able to shine a little bit more during the late spring and summer months when water retention is desirable, uh, higher water retention that is, and these products can, can deliver that for you. Other categories are peak bark media. In general, you know, peak bark media also have perlite uh, incorporated into them, especially in the greenhouse operations. So as we increase percentage of bark and perlite, we look at reducing water holding capacity. It also increases the weight of the growing media as well. So it doesn't tip over, which makes it a good outdoor growing mix. But that's up to a point. So for instance, it's the type of bark that's important. If it's a fine bark, where a lot of your pieces are eighth inch or smaller, uh, they will actually plug up your airspace. So instead of increasing airspace, it actually decreases it. And it kind of kind of makes it more of a muckier type product. So it kind of increases water holding a little bit. And it does, de does definitely dry a little bit more slowly. So it's so it makes a lot of uh, bark fines and it's probably not ideal for winter growing, but maybe it certainly can be useful for summer growing. But what most growers are looking for are the coarse bark particles, the three inch, the half inch and larger. As, the ink, as those components increase in percentages along with the perlite, we will decrease water holding capacity and definitely increase our air porosity. Now for wood, wood fiber peat based mixes, wood fiber has similar water holding capacity to peat moss and it does bump up your air porosity over peat moss. Uh, a lot of cases we hear that wood fiber is a replacement for perlite. And that's not exactly true. Perlite reduces water retention where the uh, wood fiber will tend to increase water retention. So you're not going to get that same characteristic there. They do offer very similar air processes, which would be true. But another thing I would keep in mind with wood fiber is when you mix wood fiber in with peat, because wood is a lighter color, it lightens up the overall look of the mix. And if you're like me, or like a lot of growers, uh, where you look at the surface of the growing media, you look at the color of it to determine when to water or rewater. Uh, having that lighter colored wood fiber mixed in uh, has a tendency to make the mix look light colored all the time. So it's much easier to overwater. So again, it's just simply an adjustment that needs to take place to figure that out. Now, once you have your growing media, uh, you get your components, you're, maybe you're busting apart compressed bales, or maybe you're making your own mix, there are factors that are within your control that actually do influence the physical properties of the mix. So let's start with the mixing process first. So when you're fluffing bales or making your growing media, putting the components together, you wanna to use machines with slow turning ribbons and paddles. Most everything that's out there in the market today fits that bill. But second part is you wanna minimize the amount of time that you're actually mixing these components together. Uh, the reason for it is, as we'll see down below, it creates a lot of fines. It basically busts up the, the fibers and breaks down the, the components. It's also a good idea to add some moisture. It keeps down some of your dust. Uh, it helps to fluff out the mix a little bit more so you actually get a little bit increase in volume uh, when you're filling your containers. Now with the excess mixing or fluffing, the problem is it will destroy your peat fibers and crush your aggregates. So you wanna take a nice uh, growing on type product and you wanna convert it into a plug mix, just keep it in your mixer too long and you can very easily do that. But this creation of fines is not good because it reduces the airspace in your growing mix. It makes drainage uh, through your mix slow way down. And what ends up happening is your growing media dries out slowly. So when you put a plant into that matrix, plant roots are not, shall we say, drinking the water as quickly the mix just doesn't have a lot of air movement in it. The plant roots don't grow very well. So the end result is you're not gonna have a, an ideal growing situation for that crop. So once you have your containers filled, now we look at the issue of compaction. It's not a good idea to compact the growing media. So we have a graphic here, two containers with the same amount of mix in them. The one on the left is not compacted, the one on the right is compacted. Now when you compact your growing media, the first thing that shall we say gives would be your largest pores in your growing media and those large pores are where your air is retained. So when you compress the mix, you're actually collapsing the air space in the growing media, leaving behind water a lot more, well, not necessarily more water retention, but a little bit more water retention, but you don't have much air. So as a result, you're gonna end up with a mix that just stays soggy, wet, and doesn't dry out very rapidly and will affect plant growth. 
Another component to think about is once you got your crop planted and out on the bench, now we look at the watering situation. So if we take a look at watering, it affects a lot of things about crop quality. First of all, we know that when the mix stays wet, we tend to see stretched kind of thin, kind of wimpy growth. Uh, so if you keep the water back, it'll tend to keep the plant a little bit more compact. Uh, we also see that if the mix stays a little too wet, we see more issues with root disease, specifically Pythium and Phytophthora. Um, we also see more algae growth on the media surface, which then attracts your shore flies because that's their main food source. And also can attract fungus gnats because they feed from fungi, which will grow within the growing media if it stays wet for a long period of time. So again, you want to cut these critters down and the algae down, let the media dry out more between waterings and it'll make a big difference. And of course, plant height and stretching kind of work hand in hand. Uh, instead of using growth regulators, sometimes you can use uh, uh, restricting water to actually help keep the height of plants down as well. What I find interesting is that most greenhouse operations, oftentimes the watering is relegated to employees that are, don't have a lot of experience, especially with watering. So if they're hired specifically to water crops, they're probably thinking, if I'm not watering, I'm not working. So they will continue to water and sometimes they can overwater and they can make things a, a sopping mess. So in that case, what do you do? Well, there are some tips you can use to train new employees on how to water. Uh, first one, and I think we're all aware of this, if you're going to water, the best time to do it is in the morning. This allows for the growing media surface to dry out, which minimizes some of your root disease issues to some degree. And of course, we know it also dries out your foliage, which minimizes foliar diseases. If the weather is going to be cool and cloudy, especially in the winter months, and early spring, it, it's like that almost every day anyway, your watering frequency is going to be very much reduced. You're not going to do very much watering at all. And since oftentimes that's where spring crops start is in this time of year, you're really not watering all that frequently. So you want to try and encourage your employees to keep in mind that you do little to no watering during cloudy, cold, wet days of the year because the, the plants aren't going to use the water anyway. Now, as we migrate through the season or even within that season, we can have sunny weather with really good airflow because it's warmer outside, we're opening up the vents. What's gonna happen is your plants are growing more actively. They're utilizing the water from the growing media more quickly. So watering frequency will be required to go up. So again, you water more when it's sunny, you water less when it's cloudy. So how do you know when to water? Well, one thing you can do is observe the surface of the growing media. This is especially true with peat, perlite-based mixes or just general purpose mixes. Now, in the background of this particular slide, you see kind of these cell packs in the background. The ones on the left and across the top, notice that the color of the surface of the growing media is lighter colored. The peat is a light brown to maybe a, even like a tannish color. That usually indicates it's time to water. The cell or the cell pack right dead center in the middle of the slide, notice the growing media surface is kind of a dark brown, almost black color. That would indicate that the mix is still fairly wet. You do not need to water it. So again, you can use color of the surface of the growing media as an indicator. What I tend to find is with core mixes, especially mixes that contain 20% or more core, wood fiber mixes and even bark mixes, the, um, shall we say, the, the reflection of what's going on surface, the surface tends to dry out more rapidly than underneath because you don't have that capillary structure set up quite as nicely as you do with a peat-based mix. Uh, you tend to see the surface drought faster than what's going on below. So it's not necessarily representing what's going on below. In that case, uh, pick up a container, feel the weight of it. If it feels light, time to water. If it's heavy, you don't. Another option is to stick your finger in the pot, especially larger pots. Uh, feel the moisture content. You can tell based on the feel whether or not the mix needs to be watered or not. And when in doubt, just pull the pot off the root ball and take a look at the root ball. And you can look at see where the moisture is in the mix and see if it's wet or if it's not. Chemical properties. So we're going to look at the chemical properties first of the unused growing media, then we're going to look at it as we shift into in-use you know, production of the growing media. So looking at pH and EC, so for instance most growing media are amended with limestone and the reason for that is peat moss and bark tend to be fairly acidic. We're trying to target a starting pH of, of 5.4 Hopefully not as high as 6.0, but sometimes it will, will land there, especially if the mix is a little bit on the wet side. Now, if the mix is less than two months old since it was produced, 
or if it's on the dry side, peat's a little bit drier, dustier, the limestone probably hasn't activated yet. So it's not unusual for the pH to start out below five. As a matter of fact, when we manufacture Promix in our factory, uh, we actually shoot for the ideal starting pH range. Again, this is coming off the line right after it's made in the factory between 4.6 and 4.9. That's because the lime hasn't had a chance to activate yet from moisture. We also add starter fertilizer charge into the growing media. So uh, most companies do that even with organic mixes or starter fertilizer charge. So for seedlings, usually these charges last enough to get them up to the first true leaf stage. And typically the EC starting out is between uh, 0.4 to 1.0 millimoles per centimeter. For growing on mixes or even perennial mixes, outdoor mixes, we see a persistence of about seven days on that starter fertilizer. So your EC is running a little bit higher because they're bigger plants between uh, 0.7 to 2.0. Now, as that unused mix ages inside the package, we all know about the wetting agent breaking down and it becomes hard to wet, but there's two other things that occur as well. So your pH will most likely increase, not necessarily anything that's bad. It may still stay in the fives even a year or 15 months out. But if that mix becomes wet, it's possible that, that pH of that mix could go up over six. So keep that in mind if that does take place. Your starter fertilizer also is used up by natural microorganisms that are found in the peat moss or in the bark or in the core or whatever that organic component is. Uh, so what, you, what we start out with when it's manufactured is not what we end up with at month six or month nine after manufacturing. So if your mix is older, you might wanna shoot it up or shoot it up, that doesn't sound right. You might wanna uh, give it a shot of fertilizer right from, uh, right from your first planting time to make sure there's fertilizer in the growing medium when that plant's growing. Now, once the product is actually in use, you've got a crop in it, you're actually producing a crop, uh, there are things that change the pH of that growing media. These things are not necessarily a mystery in our industry anymore, but I just wanna to touch on them real quickly. First one is water alkalinity. Water alkalinity is the measure of the amount of limestone in the water. Just keep in mind, Alkalinity measures bicarbonates and carbonates in the water and some other elements as well, but that, those are the chief ones. The carbonates and bicarbonates, if you take a look at what the chemical uh, uh, description of limestone is, is actually calcium carbonate. And it's the carbonate in the, in the limestone that causes the change in the pH of the growing media, not the calcium. So if we take a look at the amount of carbonates and bicarbonates floating in the water, that directly impacts the limestone content in the water. Now keep this in mind, every time you water with a water that has a high level of bicarbonates and carbonates into it, it's like you're liming every time you water. And the more alkalinity the water has, the higher the lime rate is. So your pH will climb faster as the alkalinity increases. So ideally you wanna match the fertilizer to the amount of alkalinity in your water. You can consult your fertilizer manufacturer to help you with that. Or if your alkalinity is above 225, 250 parts per million calcium carbonate, you may want to consider injecting acid to bring it down to maybe about 150. Now, the second factor that influences the pH you're growing media is your fertilizer. So fertilizers are labeled either as potentially having potential acidity or potential basicity. Uh, certainly if it's potentially acidic, it will tend to, it can, I should say, drop the growing media pH. Um, but not necessarily. And uh, let me see here. That little message here that I need to get rid of. There, sorry about that. Uh, with a potentially acidic fertilizer, keep in mind it can decrease the pH of the growing media. And I say can because it depends on the water alkalinity and it also depends a little bit on the crop because they influence it as well. If a fertilizer is potentially basic, it will almost always cause the pH of the growing media to go up. The last variable is the plant. So the plant will actually utilize the fertilizer to create the acid or base that changes the pH of the growing media. Now, some plants in their natural environment have adapted very well to really doing a great job of dropping the pH of the growing media. And we know these crops, geraniums, marigolds, and guinea impatiens, uh, as they use fertilizer, they can produce acid very easily. On the other side of the fence, we have calibrico and petunia, which have a tendency to 
not really drop cage very well because in their native environment, the soils are loaded full of iron and manganese, and that's why the plants don't have to fight to get it. So they actually tend to increase the pH a little bit more easily uh, because of that reason. Okay. Just have a little problem advancing my slide here. There we go. So in production, if the pH of your growing media is on the high side, what can you do? Well, first of all, look at the potential acidity of the fertilizer. If you're using something that's potentially basic or has low potential acidity, upgrade to a higher potential acidity fertilizer, such as a 201020. If you really want a, a real good jolt to your system, you can use 2177. Don't recommend that too much because it's very acidic. Uh, if you're going to use that, use that uh, during a sunny day. Other things you can do is you can increase your amount of feed you're applying either through constant feeding or using higher fertilizer application rates. Those work out very well to do that as well. If your alkalinity is on the higher side or maybe your pH is just getting away from you, acid injection is also a very viable option to bring that alkalinity down. You do not want to reduce water pH below four because that will damage foliage and also roots that are up at the media surface. We don't really recommend the old fashioned methods of iron sulfate and aluminum sulfate. They, they're inconsistent, they elevate salts, and they're not really the best in a soilless mix environment. Now correcting low growing media pH, if, if it would go the other way, switch to a potentially basic fertilizer like a 15015, for instance, it'll help keep that pH up. If you need more of a quick fix, or, or let's say your pH is just maybe a, a whole unit off, Consider using some kind of a liquid limestone, like a calox or something like that. You want to keep that solution in agitation and rinse off the foliage after so there's no res residual on the foliage itself. Another option is using potassium bicarbonate. It does rapidly adjust the pH, actually quite rapidly within a matter of probably less than an hour. The only problem is it tends to increase the EC of the growing media quite a bit because there's a lot of potassium in there. Uh, so in which case you might want to come back and leach with a calamite fertilizer shortly after application. Some growers might consider using dry limestone, sprinkling it on the surface of the growing media. It can work. It just takes a long time because you got to break that limestone down. And it doesn't all break down at the same rate. So it's a little bit more unpredictable. And the old standbys from years ago, the old caustic uh, hydrated lime, uh, not a big fan of it because it tends to cause a lot of burn on plants and it's a little unpredictable. EC. So if you're growing a crop and you see your EC is, is changing over time, what do you do? Well, first of all, we have to keep in mind that we do add, and most companies add a starter fertilizer charge, but once that's used up after that first week or if it's a plug mix uh, after that first true leaf stage, all the fertilizer then thereafter will be supplied by the grower. So you're responsible for putting in what that crop needs. Now, if that EC gets to become too high over time, several things to look at. First of all, check your water EC. Yeah, I've seen ECs of water in the two, two and a half range, which is usually the ideal range for a petunia or, or, or geranium, but that's just pure water. So that could be sodium, it could be chloride, it could be calcium, it could be the wrong elements. So check the EC of your water. Also check out the individual nutrients. Sometimes you may have a couple of elements that are accumulating in the growing media. Could be, could, maybe your water has excess of calcium or high levels of sodium or chloride. Those are making the EC go up. So it may not necessarily be fertilizer that's causing it. It could be just something going on in the water. So it's a good idea to check that. Uh, you wanna verify your fertilizer concentrate tank is mixed properly, again, Run it through your injector, run it out the end of the hose, check the EC of what's come out the end of the hose. Remember to subtract off the EC of the water. Now, if everything is correct and everything's mixed properly and your EC is still climbing, now you wanna look at your fertilizer application rate. You wanna reduce it. Uh, I'm not a big fan of just going clear water for multiple times. I mean, one or two is fine, but the problem is, is the plant will not use the nutrients all in the same ratio as they're being applied. So maybe you got excessive macronutrients, but your micronutrients are getting tapped out. It's not all that unusual. You can run into a micronutrient deficiency while you're trying to clear up a high salt problem. So keep that in mind. And last on that list is control release fertilizers. 
if you're mixing control release fertilizers or top dressing with them in your growing media, keep in mind that if you run into a heat wave, they tend to dump. This particular year, we ran into a problem in a lot of the, shall we say, the northeastern part of the United States. Back in the first week of April, we saw a lot of locations where highs were in the upper 70s, low 80s, which for the northern part of the country, that's very warm for that early in the year. Well, the problem is crops are just planted, they're young, and then all of a sudden your control lease fertilizer starts to dump at a very high and fast rate. Again, not a, not a problem with the product, it's not a manufacturing flaw, it's just it, it, it did release. So you have to watch those rates to make sure they're low enough that if this does happen, it doesn't create a problem. Now on the flip side, let's say your ECs become low over time. Again, you wanna to check to make sure your fertilizer concentrate is mixed properly, your injector is working properly. Again, check what's coming out the end of the hose. And you wanna to try to, if, if it's not coming out at the appropriate amount, or if your EC still continues to go low, maybe the crop's just utilizing the fertilizer faster than you're applying it, in which case you wanna increase the rate. Biological properties, our last topic. So if we take a look at our natural, um, shall we say organic components we add to the growing media, such as peat moss, bark, poor, they come with natural microorganisms. And these natural microorganisms are generally not pathogenic to the plant, but they do provide some minor benefits. A lot of times, if nothing else, they're just simply in the way in the growing media. So they will create a growing media environment that's got some competition with pathogens. So they're actually not a bad thing to have in there. But however, they don't do a whole lot for the plant in most situations. So if we want to introduce you know, biological organisms that benefit crops, we then turn to look at the outdoor soil environment where our biological diversity is much greater. And of course, you have greater populations of microorganisms. So it's not all that unusual if we're looking for something to add to the growing media. We look to the soil, we look at various organisms, do a lot of research on it, select out ones that create benefits so that we can now reproduce sort of the outdoor environment in the growing media situation, actually in the, uh, in the soil mix situation. Now, a lot of times when we're targeting microorganisms from the soil to put in the soilless media, we're looking at microorganisms that help plants deal with stress. Just a general kind of 30,000 feet look at that situation. So as an example, we have our growth enhancers, which are represented pretty much for the most part by mycorrhizal fungi, specifically endomycorrhizal fungi for greenhouse production. And the other group usually that we look at would be those of help to reduce root disease, uh, which I'll classify as, as biofungicides as a general term. And that would include various types of microorganisms from actinomycetes, bacteria, and fungi. So a little bit about mycorrhizae, and I'm gonna talk specifically about endomycorrhizae because they're the ones that colonize most of your greenhouse crops, your, your perennials, your vegetables, herbs, those types of crops. So essentially you have uh, spores or propagules that are in, in the growing media, either through incorporation by the company or maybe you drenched on yourself. Uh, when those spores or those propagules are sitting there, they will then germinate or send out hyphae, which are like threads that'll go in search of a root. Once they find a root, they will grow into the root, set up shop, and uh, it takes about two to four weeks for that to all take place, what we should call colonization. Then once they set up shop, they will grow out beyond the root system to bring in water and nutrients where plant roots are not present. I'm gonna show you a video after this slide, it's gonna show this, this uh, process. So the mycorrhizal fungi will help improve acquisition uptake of phosphorus, copper, manganese, zinc, and other elements, as well as water. So as a result of that, it will delay the onset of nutrient deficiencies because it can more efficiently mine out the growing media to bring in the nutrients for the plant. Mycorrhizal fungi will also reduce the effects of environmental stress on the plant. So stress is coming from drought, overwatering, believe it or not. Uh, nutrient deficiencies also, we've seen salts, uh, uh, soils are high in salts, will also benefit from having mycorrhizal fungi. And it also helps to take the edge off of extreme heat and also cold, uh, extreme cold, if you want to say. Now in return for the benefit that the plant receives, the plant will then give back some of its starches and uh, some of its uh, carbohydrates it produces to uh, feed the mycorrhizal fungi so it can continue to grow and continue to colonize the root system. 
And we also find that the plant also does provide some protection for the mycorrhizal fungi from pathogens that do not necessarily attack the plant, but will attack the endomycorrhizal fungi itself. And since that endomycorrhizal fungi is completely dependent on that plant for its life survival, it will benefit the crop throughout the entire, as long as that plant's alive, that colonization will be taking place. So here's a picture of a hyphae that's grown along the outside edge of a root. It then will penetrate between the cells of the root, of the, of the root, yes, and it'll grow down in and eventually it'll eventually pop in side a cell root, push the membrane out of the way, and it'll form this structure called an arbuscule, which is like a tree-like structure. So water and nutrients are coming in from the surrounding soil environment and are coming in through these arbuscules to feed the plant. The plant in turn will take some of its own carbohydrates and, and uh, sugars and it will give it back to the mycorrhizal fungi. So it will grow to produce more hyphae and more efficiently mine out the growing media. So we see it's like a highway system. On one side, water and nutrients are coming in from the soil. The other side, uh, carbohydrates and sugars are going back to the plant. I mean, going back to the mycorrhizal fungi to feed it. Moving on to the next category, the biofungicides. So similarly speaking, most biofungicides will grow on the tips of roots because there are sugars and exudates that come off those roots that feed these, these biofungicide organisms. So they love it. It's like, a, it's like a buffet for those microorganisms. So they will feed on there, they will multiply, and they will eventually occupy the rhizosphere of the root system. Now, they suppress disease through different modes of action. All of them suppress disease through this first one. Uh, simply by having all these microorganisms growing on the root system, they occupy root space. They create kind of a physical barrier. And then some of these microorganisms will produce natural antibodies, which will ward off uh, uh, plant pathogens from attacking the plant roots. So your bacterial and actinomycetes will tend to do that. Your fungal organisms will actually go out and physically attack and actually destroy the, the plant pathogen by killing it. So it's a different form of, of uh, suppression that it, it can actually produce. Now using these biological organisms to help suppress root disease will help to reduce the need for chemical fungicide trenches. Most growers will cut their trenches in half or maybe by 75% but they may still put something on in case something does get a little bit out of control, which can happen even with a biological additive. Um, so in general, with having the biological there, you have a healthier, stronger root system because they're not being constantly inundated with attacks from pathogens. So you get better use of your fertilization and your watering because they're there to help acquire. Uh, well, again, if you have a healthier root system, roots can take up the nutrients and it will also translate into improved plant growth. So the bottom line is if you can reduce plant loss, you can stimulate plant growth because again, the roots aren't being chewed away by these microorganisms. You can overall reduce the cost uh, of producing that crop because you're not applying as many chemical fungicide trenches and you're not seeing as much crop loss or loss of crop quality. So here's a picture. Yes, it is kind of moving around. So we have a plant root through the middle. We see all these kind of grayish blue, darker spots those are all bacillus bacterium that are feeding off of the exudates coming off those roots. So you can see there's a lot of bacteria there. It makes it difficult for a pathogen to grow through that, that, that crowd to actually get to that root system. Now here's an example of all the way to the left, you see that kind of rounded structure, that's a plant root. And around that is kind of like a halo around that. That is a bacillus pumulus biofungicide bacteria that's grown around the outside perimeter of the root. And all the webbing we see in the picture, that's the hyphae of the, of the gloma, or of the, well, glomus interaces of endomycorrhizal fungi. Now notice that some of those, um, those hyphae actually are fattened, if you want to say. You see kind of like this bluish gray haze around them. That's not the hyphae getting fat. That's actually bacillus bacteria that are growing on the outside of the hyphae. And the reason why they're growing on the outside of the hyphae is because they're being fed by the hyphae of the mycorrhizae, just like the roots. So, glomus uh, hyphae actually will, will leak exudates. And these exudates are food, again, like a feeding trough for various biological organisms. So, uh, 
especially your bacterial strains or maybe some of your actinomyces will actually feed from this. And because it's a good food source, they will tend to form a strong association with the mycorrhizal fungi because they want to continue to grow and feed from the exudates that leak out of the glomus. Now, if that bacteria that colonizes that mycorrhizal fungi hyphae happens to also be a biofungicide in the case of Bacillus pumilus that we're talking about, they will grow on the outside of that hyphae forming a physical barrier. They produce antibiotics, so they'll produce a chemical barrier around the hyphae, which protects the glomus or the mycorrhizal fungi from attack from pathogens. But because we have beneficial bacteria growing not only in the root system of the plant, but now on the hyphae of the mycorrhizae, a greater percentage of the growing media has these bacteria just flourishing and producing antibiotics, which further produces more material that suppresses the growth of plant pathogens. So it reduces, again, the need for fungicide drenches and plant loss. But keep in mind, not all biofungicide bacteria will colonize the, the, basically the hyphae of glomus uh, type uh, uh, endomycorrhizal fungi. So again, not all bacteria, not all, um, let me say this again, not all biofungicides colonize mycorrhizae. So here's an example. Uh, the, in both pictures, the, the plants on the left are basically grown without any biological additives. The ones on the right contain a biofungicide and, and mycorrhizae. And we see that there's a definite growth difference. Now, I want to point out these plants are not being fed to their optimal level. So they're kind of a little bit on the hungry side. So the ones with no active ingredients are succumbing to the nutrient deficiency, starting to yellow up, and it's keeping their growth rate uh, markedly uh, held back or, or reduced. But the plants on the right, on the other hand, they've had uh, these biological organisms bring in the water and nutrients where the plant roots aren't present. You got the biofungicide in there to help with a little bit of enhanced nutrient uptake as well, but also keeping the root system healthy and clean from plant pathogens. So as a result, the plants are bigger and a lot less chlorosis. Now, again, they're bigger not because they're growing faster than they should. They're just simply growing more at their optimal rate because there's less stress that's taking place. And with that, we have reached the end of the presentation. And I think Chris will take it over from here. Yeah, let me go ahead and uh, stop your share, although I hate to do that because that was an excellent slideshow. <laughs> great, great information, Troy. You've baffled our audience. I haven't seen any questions come in, and I hope it's not because I forgot to set something properly, but I don't I don't think so. So if you've got questions, now's the time to type them in. But I've got I've got a few. I'm going to start with one that actually came from one of our viewers, and she's okay. on, the, on the call today, or the, the, the uh, webinar, uh, Karen was asking about mycorrhizae and um, is more better? More mycorrhizae and are there different, say, species of mycorrhizae and the mm -hmm. more you have the better or maybe do they compete with one another? Talk a little bit about that. Well, that's that's a lot of questions there. So uh, is more better? More is better from a standpoint that it's all about location. So the closer the mycorrhizal fungi, whether it's a spore or a propagule, is to the actual root, the quicker it will colonize the plant roots. So more will put them in closer proximity just by simple statistics. But more doesn't necessarily mean you colonize more roots. It just simply means you colonize them faster, which gives you benefits faster. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are multiple strains that are out there. Uh, some strains will work better with some plants than others. That is true. Um, but we tend to focus on one strain because we look at something that's robust, that can survive well in growing media and, uh, and tends to create the greatest amount of benefit for the greatest number of crops. So again, are there other species that could be better and more beneficial to some crops? Yes, but not to all. Okay, and Tech is adding that directly into the potting mix that you can buy or is it, or is it available as an additive with the biofungicide? Well, the, we, we have it in two flavors, so you can buy the mix with the mycorrhizae by itself or with the mycorrhizae and biofungicide included together. Uh, so you can get it that way. As far as we do sell mycorrhizae as a standalone item now, so you can buy the inoculum in okay. what we call the Connect or in our Mike product line. Right. And does that, does that, you showed it with bedding plants, so it obviously makes sense on fairly quick turn crops and not just longer turn nursery crops. What about, what about a plug producer? Well, plug producer, the, the thing is with the mycorrhizal fungi is you need a lot of it to get into those small little 
those little cells. So it takes a high concentration. So you can do it, but it increases costs a little bit. But if that's not an issue, yeah, the earlier you can colonize a plant makes more sense because then more uh, you can transfer that to, to the next stage of the plant life cycle. But again, the benefits, like I said, it takes about two to four weeks for that colonization to take place. So the sooner you can do it, the quicker you see benefits. All right, very interesting. And do those benefits uh, transfer out to the end consumer and her garden? Yes, because the mycorrhizal fungi needs that plant to survive. So when you transplant it out into the soil environment and then you have roots that are grown out into the surrounding uh, soil environment, the mycorrhizal fungi can grow at 10 times the rate of what uh, plant roots can grow. So they'll be out there speeding along. They're, they're continuing to recolonize those roots. I mean, they will, of course, grow out beyond that root system, look for other plant roots to colonize. Yes, you will be able to transfer that benefit to your garden. Very cool. So that's a good, uh, a good talking point for, uh, for growers to share with retailers and on down the path. Now, mm -hmm. somebody told me, one of my colleagues, in fact, when I told her I had just turned over my garden, getting it ready for, for my spring planting, she said, don't do that. You're, t you're, you're destroying the natural biome, the environment. You're tearing up all those fibers. Is that true? Should I leave it alone and just plant without disturbing the soil? Yeah, that is, that is true to some degree, especially your, your fungal organisms. So for instance, you might have a natural, it's usually not a high population, but you'll have a natural population of mycorrhizal fungi. What we find is as soon as you till, you destroy the hyphae, and a lot of times the tilling equipment will actually smash the spores of the mycorrhizae. So spores, think of like seeds with plants or spores to mycorrhizae. So yeah, it, it causes a lot of damage. And it's not just the mycorrhizae, but it's also the microorganisms too. So yeah, you can actually reduce the population of microorganisms oh, by mixing it up. Take it easy on my uh, on my hidden creatures there in my vegetable yeah. garden. All right, <laughs> Debbie wants to know. Debbie's from uh, from Disney. Cool. She oh. wants to know what is a good substitute for long fiber sphagnum moss for growing topiary. And I wonder if that's and Debbie, maybe you can weigh in with a, with a, a clarification. Is that for the topiary form? Or is it for the mix that the plant is growing in? I suspect it's probably for the form because you're putting plants right on those forms. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, the long fiber peat isn't quite as plentiful out there as it used to be. I mean, it still exists, yes, but I think the market demand exceeded the amount that's out there. So as far as a substitute... And she did clarify it is for the form itself that you stuff yeah. with, uh, with uh, long fiber sphagnum. Yeah, the only thing I can think of, uh, I mean, it's not something I've actually been asked before, but it's a good question. Maybe long fiber core, if you can get a, you know, longer fibers because you can create basket meshes out of that insert. So that mm -hmm. might work in, in a situation like that. Uh, we could find out if anyone has done uh, wood, used uh, wood fiber or looked into wood fiber as a topiary form. You know what? That's, that's a great question. I do not know that answer. All right. I know some of the wood fiber people. Um, speaking of which, speaking, uh, I've, found it interesting when you were describing the different uh, um, types of uh, soil um, uh, or mix amendments. Um, when you mentioned wood fiber, you said it increases water holding capacity and the air, air holding capacity at the same time. How does that work? Well, it's kind of like peat moss. It's that, that mystery. So um, the components themselves, because they pack loosely together, they create bigger pores so you get good air space. But also with on, on the properties of cells, they tend to cling or the water tends to cling to it. I mean, yeah, you can say it about any component, but where perlite creates a lot of big gaps, these tend to create uh, smaller gaps. So you tend to, tend to create a lot more space for water retention. It's kind of hard to say, but you know, also water is retained within the structure of some of these components too, that can be released back. Whereas with perlite or vermiculite, well, for me, that's a bad example. For perlite water, that actually water doesn't penetrate into the structure, right. so it can't be released later. Right, 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 for sure. All right, we've got a question from Aaron who wants to know, what recommendations do you have for sanitizing a native soil that will be blended into a potting mix so that you can kill the pathogens that are in that native soil but not destroy the beneficial organisms? Ooh. Beneficial, yeah. If you if you're trying to kill the pathogens, you're going to kill the the natural microorganisms too. In in the soil, that is. So, 
Um, the, the best thing I still am aware of is, is doing the steam sterilization. I know it's a pain because you can't do very big batches, but it does work fairly well. So you have to get that up to, I think it's 180 degrees for, I'm not sure what the time frame is, mm -hmm. but the longer you cook it, the more you kill. And then add those beneficials back in yourself. Yeah. That way you know that your soil doesn't have any of the, uh, the, uh, the, the bad pathogens. Yeah. Uh, to that, to that, to that effect. Yeah, it was what seventy-five years ago when the Cornell mixes came out. Uh, you know, the it's soil is that we're gonna, you know, it's the modern science, right? You know, modern chemistry, and they basically removed all of those natural organisms, the beneficials from mm -hmm. our container growing. Uh, and it looks like all of the mix companies, certainly Premier Tech, is working hard on bringing that natural chemistry. Uh, that natural uh, biological environment back into the mix. How, uh, that's true, but talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so a couple of things to think about. Um, I mentioned there are natural microorganisms that occur in in peat moss and in you know bark and, and corn and all that. We all have experienced that when we open up a bag, we see mold growing on the top of the of the mix or on the bark or whatever, and that that's natural microorganisms. So they're good, but they don't really benefit. But in the soil environment, we have a lot of pathogens in there. Uh, so something is curbing those pathogens from creating a problem with the crop. So that's why we're going to the soil to look for those things to bring them into the soilless mix to try to increase that. It's interesting, if you take a little bit of soil and you mix it into a soilless mix and you don't sterilize the soil, the most aggressive critters take over that soilless mix environment, which of course are your pathogens. <laughs> and that's why it's so important to sterilize soil if you're gonna mix it into a growing media. Uh, but the reason why companies don't use soil anymore is because between contamination with, uh, with whatever was dumped onto that field, uh, just simply the lack of soil out there, it, it just became too difficult to find a good reliable source. So that's why soilless went, went the way it did. Sure. Um, uh, Debbie from from uh, from Disney said she's looking. She was looking for something friendlier for her topiary forms, and that leads to the question of peat availability. Any stigma with you know it's it's uh, 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 doesn't uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You know it's not a renewable resource, and yet it I hear it does kind of renew itself. So there's you know mi mixed information about that. Talk a little yeah. bit about peat availability, the future alternatives, et cetera. Yeah, so so peat moss. There's in, now I'm talking Canada only. So Russia is actually has the biggest reserve of peat in the world, but Canada has 270 million acres of peat moss, and of which currently 70,000 acres are being used just for horticultural purposes. Wait, say those numbers again. So 270 million acres of peat moss. Million and 70,000 that are being 70,000 that's being used to produce mixes. So if you look at the ratio it's reproducing faster than what we're actually harvesting it. Now, obviously at the harvest site itself, we're not seeing a reproduction of that because we, we were harvesting from that area. And a bog will last anywhere from 30 to maybe 60 years in harvest life. So it's not like we're going out there and destroying one area and then moving on and moving on and moving on. Uh, it's basically we're in one area, we're in there for quite a while. So, uh, so that takes place. The other thing is, uh, a lot of companies are now reclaiming the land, so they'll actually go in there, reflood the area, uh, put straw down, put, if we open up a new bog, we'll take the live moss from that, put it on with a manure spreader on that area, lightly, uh, kind of lightly submerge it, if you want to say, and then we'll grow, the moss will regrow, and usually within five to 12 years, that bog will be back to a fully functional mm -hmm. ecosystem. So it's in our best interest, and certainly from the Canadian government's perspective, try to keep those bogs going. All right, great, inf great information. Uh, shorter term though, costs of everything have gone up, availability is tough, you can't get trucks, et cetera. What's the, what's the outlook for potting mixes for the rest of 21 into 22? Maybe it's a salesman question. Yeah. <laughs> what do you know? Well, I would say this, uh, you know, our sales were up 30% this year and up 25% the year before. Uh, so to increase by 50% in two years, the problem that a lot of companies have, ours included, is we just don't have the capacity to make everything that we need. So what happens is we, we put the orders in the system and we, we try to produce the best we can, but it creates a delay 
And that's where a lot of the shortages are coming from or delays. Um, you know, harvest of peat, which is all predicated on weather. So far, so far, cross our fingers, it's been good up to this point. So our peat supply is, is good. Uh, if we get a lot of rain, it's going to reduce the amount we can harvest. So that might might have an influence on it. Uh, so really, yes, trucking is a little bit limited. We run into problems. We run out of bags. We couldn't get them. We run out of perlite. We couldn't get that. You know, there's a lot of a lot of moving parts here that, that it takes to make a mix. And if one is out, we, we can't make mix. So that that's also contributed to some of the problems too. So to answer your question, I think we're still going to have a a supply is going to be a little bit tight this year, but I think after after this upcoming fall season going into the 22, 2022, I think we're going to see things lighten up a little bit. All right. Now, All right. We, get, now we just get pots to put your nice mix into. That's right. <laughs> All right. We're going to, uh, if you got more questions, we're going to wrap it up there question wise. But if you have more, Troy is happy to answer them. You see, he's a very forthcoming mm -hmm. young man. Troy uh, Beagle. B-U-E-T at premiertech.com. He's standing by 24 uh, seven to answer you because he's into this stuff as you can, as you can well tell. And as I said, um, if you had to leave early, well, that means you're not here right now, but if you want to share this with friends, colleagues, uh, et cetera, or watch it again to get those specific details uh, or see that mycorrhizae growing down into the cells, uh, growtalks.com slash webinars is the uh, the place to do that same place you sign up i tell you that's convenient all right that said uh oh and i wanted to give troy you, you are actually speaking on a similar topic at cultivate 21 i think i just saw that on facebook today is that correct yeah tuesday you wanna, uh, pitch for yourself yeah tuesday i believe it's at 9 30 in the morning um i'm i don't know what room it is but it'll be myself and bioworks and mycorrhizal applications one other company we're going to have kind of a uh, town hall discussion and uh, y'all can come in and ask questions and we'll 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 do our best to answer them very cool very cool cultivate 21 where we will be live with no masks thank goodness <laughs> i think yeah i think that's going to be stay changed. safe yeah. until then how about not <laughs> exactly get carried exactly. away and cause any problems i was just right. in california last week and it almost felt normal dare i say it almost felt normal except for that plane ride but <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, thanks for attending. Troy, thanks for the uh, for the great information. I'll look for sure. you at Ohio. Uh, on behalf of Troy and uh, all of his colleagues there at Pre Premier Tech, and on behalf of uh, everybody at Ball Publishing who works hard so I don't have to, I'm Chris Beatty saying so long, everybody. Thanks for attending. Zoom wave. <laughs> Take care.